30 plus years, I've seen every type of child grow up. It's always a delight to just talk about how we leave a legacy for generations to come. Don't let emotions win. Let truth win. It's been able to change into a time of my life that I am grateful for. You moms and dads are wired with everything you need to be a parent to a great kid. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. This is episode four, Dads Wanted. I'm your host, Dr. Meg Meeker. And before I get started, let me tell you something. In all of my years of work, I see a common thread with children who are struggling. It's going to be hard for many of you to hear, but I'm here to tell you the truth. Those struggles are often connected to their fathers. A father is the most important man in his daughter's life and in his son's life. Just how important is a father? Well, he's the first exposure of male love to his children. And moms, if your child doesn't have a father figure in his or her life, I really want you to find ways to get strong male mentors that you trust and seek out opportunities for them to engage the lives of your children. Even if there's been an absence, it's never too late to begin pouring love into their lives with a strong male father figure. Fathers are so extremely important, and I want to shine a light on that in this episode. Also, dads, many of you wrote to me, you submitted questions, and I'm going to be featuring a wonderful, wonderful question. How can I teach my daughter she's beautiful the way she is? And I have a very special guest on this episode, my good friend, Mr. David Tyree. Now, you may have heard that name before. It may sound familiar. But David works for the New York Giants, and he played for them in the Super Bowl when they beat the Patriots in 2008. David Tyree caught the ball on his helmet, and the crowd went wild. I'll ask him about that crucial catch that he caught that changed the outcome of the Super Bowl. And we'll also discuss the work he does now mentoring the New York Giants team and why fathers are so important in the lives of children. Like I always do, I'm going to give you some points to ponder, and you'll be able to activate them right away. Dads, listen to me. You probably have no idea what your presence and attention does for your child. So forget guilt or regret and just listen and receive this episode today for the betterment of your child. And as a reminder, if you're enjoying listening to my podcast, don't just listen or download individual episodes. Click the subscribe button next to the title of the podcast. Tell your family and friends to do the same. This is a great help to me and the podcast, but more importantly, it's a great help for you because every episode will automatically go into your show feed. So thanks again for listening to episode four, Dad's Wanted. You're going to love it. Stay with us. Now, let's get social. I want to hear from you and interact with you. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or go to megmeekermd.com and click on the links. You can send me a question on Facebook or email it to askmeg at megmeekermd.com. That's askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Let's go to the first question, and it comes from Josh, and his question is, how can I teach my daughter. She's beautiful the way she is. What a marvelous question. Thank you so much, Josh. I'm first of all, applaud you for the fact that you're thinking about that, that you don't want her to just feel like her value comes from her looks or the way she dresses. And unfortunately, there are a whole lot of girls who feel that way. Some studies show that about one third of third grade girls have already been on a diet. So our culture is obsessed with the way girls look, and unfortunately, the girls themselves become obsessed with the way they look. And it's true for boys, but I think the pressure begins sooner for girls. So the fact that you want to show your daughter that she's beautiful for things that are deeper than just her looks, I applaud you. First thing that I would like to encourage you to do is think about the way you talk to her. You know, we're used to wanting to say, oh, you look so pretty, or oh, you look so lovely, or boy, that dress looks nice on you, or gee, did you get a nice haircut? It looks really pretty. Steer away from compliments that have to do with her looks. When you want to compliment her, compliment her character, compliment her intellect. 
Compliment her feelings. Compliment her faith. The things that you do want to say to her are things like, you know what, honey? You are such a beautiful person. I admire your patience. I saw you talk with that friend of yours and you showed so much empathy or compassion. I saw you go into that test and I know you were afraid, but you were courageous. You have so much courage for somebody your age. You don't want to say, gee whiz, you look like you've lost weight. You look really good. Or, boy, you're beautiful in that dress. You get what I'm saying. Don't be paranoid about never saying your daughter's beautiful. It's fine to say your daughter's beautiful, but the whole point is you don't want your focus to be there. You want the focus of your compliments, the focus of your praising of her as a person to come from focusing on her character, not her external being. Our next question comes from Ruben, and he asks, how can I give equal time to my five daughters? God bless you, Ruben. Five daughters, you have your hands full. What a great dad to be asking how he can parent his girls the same way and how he can be equal, how he can give them equal time. Just the fact that you want to do that lets me know that you're a very conscientious dad who's working very, very hard. Let me just tell you, Ruben, first of all, it's really hard to parent each of our kids equally. It's just life. Some kids demand more of our attention. Some kids get sick more frequently, and we end up being with them at the hospital. Some kids want to play sports, and some kids don't. So don't beat yourself up if you can't divide your time equally all the time with your kids. But here's what you do want to do. You want to let each of your daughters know that your desire is to be with each of them the same amount of time. Your desire is to have a great relationship with everyone one of them. You want a great relationship with them, but realize, Ruben, your relationship with your oldest daughter is going to be very different than your relationship with your middle daughter and the youngest daughter. That's fine. That's fine. There are going to be times you feel closer to your older daughter, closer to your younger daughter, and that's the way life is. So just give yourself some grace in that area. As far as spending equal time, here's what I would do. I would take a month-long calendar, and I would look down, and I'd say, okay, here are the times that I'm at work, and here are the times that I'm playing softball, or here are the times I'm doing something with my wife. And I would carve out one evening per week, and I would write that daughter's name in over that time. So let's say you take a Friday night every week, and you put your one daughter in one Friday night, the next daughter in the next Friday night, the third Friday night, you put another daughter, and so on and so forth. If If you can't find a night, then find an afternoon. If you can't find an afternoon, maybe breakfast. You know, it's hard not to find a day, at least one day a week, where you can't take somebody out to breakfast. You take them to your favorite breakfast spot at 7 in the morning from 7 to 8.30 and then drop them off at school. Maybe you do it on a Saturday morning. Be intentional. Use your calendar. Write their names on the calendar, and then when you do that, go to each of them and say, listen, girls, I want to be with each one of you at least sometime during the week. So this is what I'm going to do. Every Friday night or whatever time you choose, each one of you gets to pick what we're going to do during that time. And then they get to choose where you go out to dinner, what park you go to, whatever it's going to be. But you let them know that that time is reserved for them and them alone. And just the mere fact that you do that will communicate to them that you're dying to be with them. You want to hear from them. You enjoy their company. And when you have that special time with each of you girls, don't use it as a time to resolve conflicts. Don't bring up topics that are going to create an argument. And don't use it as a time to smooth things over. It should be a fun time, a light time, and tough topics should be prohibited. I hope that helps you, Ruben. As always, friends, keep sending your questions at askmeg at megmeekermd.com. Again, that's askmeg at megmeekermd.com. So let's get into it, parents. I want to share three points to ponder regarding fathers. One, if every father could see himself from behind his child's eyes for just 15 minutes, his life would never be the same. 
your child sees you as so much larger and smarter and stronger and heroic and better than you see yourself. And that's really one of the reasons that I wrote Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters, because I believe that if dads could just take a peek at who they are from behind their kids' eyes, they would live differently, they would parent differently, they would be happier And I know many of you men out there don't believe that because you think, no, my kids just don't seem that affectionate or they just don't like to be with me. Let me tell you something. They do. What you see and hear from them often is not what their heart really wants. For any of you parents out there who are divorced, divorced moms, you need to really listen up because your child needs and deserves a better relationship with your ex-husband or the father of your children, regardless what you think about him. And it's your job to encourage a better relationship between your kids and that father because every child sees his or her father as bigger, grander, more heroic and more wonderful than they really are. And I really believe that if fathers could see who they are from their child's vantage point, they really would live different lives. Second, regardless what you as a dad think about yourself, your son or daughter needs and wants you. And I know this is hard for you to believe because their body language and their speech may tell you otherwise, but don't believe it. Children need their dads, especially if dads, if you have a teenage girl in your home and you go to hug her and she feels like a telephone pole with porcupine quills all over her and it hurts you to actually hug her and you think that's the last time I'm going to do that because clearly she wants nothing to do with me. Remember, her posture is not about you. She is rigid because she feels ugly. She feels bad about herself. And I've said this before, don't take your child's behavior or body language personally. Children go through all sorts of phases where they feel ugly, they feel fat, they feel too short, too tall, you name it, too stupid, whatever, and they feel badly about themselves. That's what the teenage years and growing up is all about. So you need to see that. Don't ever, ever take them personally. Dads, your children need you. I'm currently working on another book for dads and the research that's coming out on how time with a dad increases the child's intelligence, lowers their risk for having depression, anxiety, poor self-esteem. They do better in school with a dad around. Uh, They make more money when they get out of school, when they have a dad around. You name it, every aspect of their lives gets better better the more time they spend with their fathers. So we've got to be about the business, ladies, of encouraging our dads. Three, pursue your kids. You're the grown-up. You're the dad. You can do the tough stuff. You're the leader. So even if it feels uncomfortable, you need to pursue your kids, particularly if you have teenagers, and particularly if you have teenagers who are snarky and don't want to talk to you. Dads get their feelings hurt often more frequently than mothers, I think. Because when kids make a bad face at him, dad goes, okay, that's enough of that. I Clearly, you don't want me. I'll see you in another eight years or so when you're a grown-up. It's the worst thing you can do. Pursue your children. Dads, listen to me. Your son or daughter need you available and present in their lives when they're teenagers more than when they're young kids. And the only way you can really engage your teenagers is if you take an attitude that you will pursue them. Don't be obnoxious. Don't hug them in public. Don't say things that are going to embarrass them. Don't post on their Facebook page. But make it a priority to constantly talk to your kids, to ask them questions, to listen to them, to pursue them. So this is very, very important. When you feel that you want to move away from your struggling child, whether it's an eight-year-old having temper tantrums or a two-year-old or a 20-year-old, move towards them, not away from them. Be gentle. Don't be overbearing. Pursue them and persevere, but don't overstep boundaries with kids. And we'll talk about that later. Teens won't initiate healing in a relationship or even work towards a healthier one. You have to. Dads, I'm calling on you. You're the leaders in your home. Leaders don't have to be authoritarian. They don't have to be mean. They don't have to be harsh. A leader is the one who takes the initiative to make life in the home better. 
That's what your kids want. That's what you can do. And I'm right here to help you. I want you to listen in on my conversation with my special guest, David Tyree. He is such a stand-up guy, and I know you're going to love hearing what he has to say. I have as a guest my dear friend, whom I admire, David Tyree. Now, some of you are going to recognize his name because he helped win the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 42, and he's here to talk with me about being a dad. Before we do that, um, David, well, first of all, thanks for joining me. Oh, listen, it's my greatest, greatest honor to be with my esteemed friend, Dr. <laughs> Meg Meeker. It's mutual. It's mutual. Um, I want to put you in a time and place in history, and I want to put you on a field, because I've heard you tell this story, which is very different from what people know. But let's pretend it's 2008. It's Super Bowl 42. The Giants, your team, are losing to the Patriots, and you've only got a few seconds to go, and you, David Tyree, are on the field what was that like? Oh, my goodness. What was that like? Um, I guess you could say um, it's a moment of anxiety, but it's also a moment that you've, you know, you've longed for and uh, worked for, uh, you know, in, in regard to your gift and your talent and profession at this level. So it's kind of miraculous even how I was in position because I didn't play much and I didn't have a lot of production as a receiver in 2007 season to, into 2008. And, you know, there were some injuries that occurred. Uh, with Jeremy Shockey, who was our tight end. And then as he went down, we came into more four wide receiver sets. And I was expecting to have a big game. But to really get into the fine-tuned elements that makes this special for me is the night before one of my teammates' mother was a pastor in Jacksonville, Florida. So I got the chance to get to know her. Mm -hmm. And the night before the game, she said, David, the Lord is going to quicken your feet. He's going to give you hind's feet like the feet of a deer to jump high. Mm. And then she said to me, God is going to put spiritual glue on your hands. And mm. the last thing she said to me is, the Lord is going to give you the big play. Wow. <sighs> How did that make you feel? Oh, my goodness. Um, this is the night before the biggest game of my life. Yeah. And so I was supercharged. I'm a believer. So, you know, I, I recognize that obviously God mm -hmm. speaks. So I just received the word. I believe the word. And when she said God's going to give you the big play, I actually had in, my, had in mind uh, the play that was actually a part of the game plan. What was it going to be? It was a touchdown that I scored that no one cares about. So when I scored that touchdown, I'm giving God all the glory. And um, lo and behold, the Lord sets me up for really what became the big play, ah. what we call Catch 42. So everything in that regard was just about me having an opportunity to be somebody who's less esteemed. And that's my testimony. I was just an available athlete who, who wanted to honor Jesus, and he sure found a great stage to do it. So you made a touchdown. In that Super Bowl, did you think you were done? Did you think, oh, well, that's what God gave me, so now I can just go sit on the bench? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it wasn't necessarily about <laughs> sitting on the bench, but I was definitely certain that that was more than enough. Yeah. Well, tell us about the big play. The big play is, it was actually 62 max YSL union. And that means I've run a post on the outside. Guy inside has been running an outbreaking route. And there's some in-breaking routes on the other side of the field with the other receivers. Okay. And so I'm running a deep post for all my football fans out there. They know what that is. Running toward deep toward the middle of the field. And none of that really mattered because they, the Patriots put on a, a serious pass rush and Eli Manning was under the rest. And, you know, he found every bit of, you know, I don't, I don't want to call it courage, but it was it was a miraculous um, escape on his end. You know, a Houdini trick. Yeah. And he escaped the pass rush. Roll right. And, you know, we kind of locked arms. And at that moment, it was like this real chariots of fire, slow motion moment. I went up with two hands and I was embracing for contact. But in my heart, I'm just saying I'm not letting it go. I remember one hand coming off of the football and I remember placing that hand back on to secure the football. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing I know. I actually did not see a replay of the catch until I got back to the hotel. I didn't know that this would be something that, you know, would be remembered, you know, in Super Bowl history or NFL history. Obviously, there's a <laughs> there was an element to that play that we call you know I guess you say we call that playing above the X's and O's. Yeah. Well, I will tell you for what you've been through and the life you've lived, you're an extraordinarily humble man, and I know that um, the Lord is first and foremost in your life at all times, and that's just what's so cool about you is it just oozes out. Would it be a fair statement to say that your mom made you? the player that you were and the father that you are? 
Well, yeah, I, th- I think it would definitely be a fair statement to say that my mother was very into athletics. And so it did bring me a great measure of joy. You know, I remember watching uh, Wimbledon's with my mother. I'm talking about she was just a sports fan. We would watch the World Series together, things of that nature. I'd just sit down on her floor, be with her in the room. Mm-hmm. As far as, you know, my dad, where he was very much a part of my life. Um, he was not in the home. He'd sign me up for football, you know, obviously, you know, all those things. So he's always been a part of the process and been one of, you know, the extremely proud father. But, um, yeah, my mom was definitely a part of that inspiration, um, you know, and that drive and determination to excel athletically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So did she push you pretty hard? No. Or, or, did, know, she, or did she just see that you had talent and gifts and you liked it and she just encouraged you? Yeah, yeah. She was definitely a great encourager, but she was also, she didn't hold any punches, though. I remember I dropped a pass in a playoff game in high school. What could have been a game-winning touchdown pass, which would have put us in the state championship. And I'm a little down. You know, thank God we end up winning the game. And I'm expecting this great word of comfort. And she gave me this note. And it was an acronym that basically read out, look the ball into your hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty so good. It was a delightful moment, but I was very much self-motivated when it came to, you know, my aspirations with football. Mm-hmm. Very, very, very cool. I've spent a lot of time working with the NFL on the importance of mentoring. I know that you feel strongly about mentoring and encouraging people and teaching people and bringing them along. And so right now you work for the Giants. You don't play anymore. But what is your role at the Giants now? So I'm the director of player engagement, which basically affords me the opportunity to do exactly what you just said. I stand as a liaison to their growth I assist them as far as resources and programs that will lead to their overall development. And that's on the field and off the field. Mm -hmm. Just trying to, you know, really be a bridge to health and success. So it deals into everything from relationships, how we transition into the National Football League um, and take full advantage of this experience. Mm -hmm. Just developing their whole person. Mm -hmm. Well, Let me ask you a hard question and I'm going to sort of put you on the spot here. What are your biggest challenges as a father? Oh my goodness. My biggest challenges has easily been dealing with some of the insufficiencies that I lacked in my relationship with my father. And what I'm saying is I want to really connect and I found it hard and difficult at some junctures to find places to connect with my son. He's not interested very much deeply in athletics. Mm-hmm. You know, he would like to believe that he's interested in technology, but it's more games. So yeah. <laughs> like, I think it's just been that long to really connect. Whereas um, my father, since he wasn't in the home, he wasn't able to teach me how to paint. He wasn't mm-hmm. able to teach me how to change my oil. He mm-hmm. wasn't able to teach me to do some of the things that would naturally come in a healthy mm-hmm. um, nuclear environment. Right. And so... Those things were lost, and, and I, I, sometimes I feel a lack of being able to just naturally pass down things to my son. To all the men out there who didn't have great relationships with their dads or never knew their dad, how would you tell them to become a good dad? Can they become good dads? And then how do they do that? I think that's a fantastic question. The human heart that is, uh, you know, respectably healthy has a desire to excel at this. And I think most fathers just want to provide a better experience than what they've had, you know. And it's not a shot at, you know, any of their previous experience because some people have had great fathers. Maybe they want to provide exactly what they had. Mm -hmm. But some of us have had some experiences that, you know, they would like to avoid. Mm -hmm. And so we we just want to, you know, provide a healthier environment. And I think that's where I started having my first son at 21 years old in college and not knowing what was going to happen. So uh, number one, I think you just have to have the right desire. You know, I think that alone will motivate you to get on the course to get what's necessary. I think what has allowed me to excel at this point was having a good image of my heavenly father, understanding his heart toward me, his desire toward me. My faith has really propelled me to excel at this and recognize the importance of it and the fact that I only get one chance. And so I think I'm much more intentional about trying to excel and overcome my lack and recognize that he is sufficient in all things and I can get this done. And so, you know, I don't think there's a perfect script because each individual is its own individual, but we have some areas that we can never neglect as far as their instruction, their discipline, and their overall welfare and how we care for their souls. Mm -hmm. So I think, number one, they can absolutely be successful. The roadmap to that is not cookie cutter. 
And I think as long as we're, you know, teachable and look for instruction, then we'll get what's necessary to be successful as fathers. Mm -hmm. That is beautifully, beautifully said. This is why I feel it's so important for our listeners to hear from you, David, because in America, you hold one of the highest sought after, dreamed after positions, you know, and yet... In talking to you, that's really not the heart of who you are. The heart of who you are is being a great man and a great dad. You love the Lord, and that's what really counts. And men need to know that. I remember asking you, and I'll ask you again, if you had the chance of going in, playing the Super Bowl, and having a guaranteed win and being the star of the Super Bowl, or... Going and seeing one of your children born, which would you choose? Well, going in and seeing one of my children born. You know, you're asking a man who has seven children, so it's kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first. Okay, you're first. Now, if you're talking you're about first. the first one, there's nothing like the experience of being in a room when your child is born. Mm-hmm. But in my heart of hearts, I've never missed one of my child's births. Yeah. So, um, I mean, like, thank God I've never been in that position. <laughs> <laughs> I really put your back against the wall, didn't I? See, but the whole thing is that here's a man who's lived both sides. You know, you've lived with tremendous amount of professional financial success. And you've lived as a dad with seven kids. And, you know, the richness and the joy and the pleasure that you get from each And there's heartache in each, too, but they're so different. They're so different. And I think anybody, if they are committed to being a good, engaged dad, can have that joyful part of life that you, David, enjoy. Oh, absolutely. I just want to salute them and recognize that this is a task that we have to be intentional about as far as, you know, imparting life into the next generation There's no dress rehearsal and there's no written script for success, but there are some ways that we can begin to mend some of the wounds uh, through the ills of brokenness. And I think the man has the authority to impart and to affirm the course of our children. I think that's a really powerful gift to take advantage of. Mm. But nothing has changed my life more other than Jesus Christ himself than the birth of my first son. Mm. And so nothing had changed me more immediately because it was the first time where I really began to consider someone other than myself. And he altered my life. Mm. And so that's the opportunity that presents itself where we engage this opportunity to impact and impart into another individual's life. Mm. That's the David Tyree Hart. I am so grateful that you came, and I will say I'm sure glad that all of your children have you as a dad and that the New York Giants have a mentor like you. So I hope and pray that you are imparting all of this to your colleagues and to the men on the team because they need it, David. They need you in there doing just what you do best. I'm delighted to have the opportunity. Hopefully more men will ask the right questions and we'll have the opportunity to create some of those lasting conversations. And it's always a delight to just talk about life and the importance of these opportunities, decisions, and how we intentionally leave a legacy for generations to come. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, David. Sure appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Meg. You're loved. You have a good one, okay? Love to you, too. I'll talk to you later. Mothers and grandmothers, Father's Day's just around the corner. If you're looking for something for the father of your daughter, please check out the Strong Father's Strong Daughters resources. From the book to the 30-day challenge to my brand new devotional for dads, there's no better way to thank a dad for the influence and impact he has on his daughters. They're all available on Amazon. Just search Strong Father's Strong Daughters or find them in a bookstore where you shop. You know, the majority of fathers I've met feel inadequate about themselves as dad in some areas of their parenting. And I say this because many times I'll ask a dad how life is going, or I ask him a question about one of his kids, and they say, well, I know I'm not doing a very good job, but, and I stop them dead sentence. I say, wait a minute. Why do you say, I know I'm not doing a good job, but... I say, how do you know you're not doing a good job? 
they look at me kind of with a blank stare and go, well, I, I, I just I just know I should be doing better. And I just don't I just feel very inadequate as a dad. This isn't right, friends. Usually, in my experience, fathers are doing a whole lot better than they think they are. The problem is our culture beats dads up so badly and we need to stop this. We need to tell our fathers, you know what? You can do this. You can be a great dad. I don't care what your history shows. I don't know where you've been and what you've done. And I know you've made a whole lot of mistakes as a man, as a boy, and probably as a dad and as a husband, as a boyfriend. But the truth is, get past those. Start today and look forward because... You, dad, are wired with everything you need to be a really good dad to your son or daughter, period. So believe that and move forward and get this thinking that, well, I'm just not very good, but I'll give it my best shot. That comes straight from our culture. It's a lie you believe, and you've got to stop it. You've got to retrain the way you think because you need to feel more confident as a father, and your kids need you to feel confident as a dad. If you're trying to parent them sort of walking around with hunched shoulders and a downcast face thinking, well, I think I can do this. I I hope I can discipline you. Or you're not paying any attention at all to your parenting and you're just flying off the handle all the time and screaming at your kids, then you're going to feel horrible about your parenting. So be intentional. Think about your role. Think about your responsibility. Grab hold of it. Take it seriously because you have power in your child's life. So own it and temper it. Use it the way it should be used. Every child takes one man to the grave. That's his or her dad. Now, you who are sons and daughters know exactly what I'm saying. Because maybe you're out there and you're 25, 35, 45. Part of you still aches for your father to like you, to approve of your job, to like the way you're parenting, to come along and pat you on the shoulder and look you in the eye and go, wow, you're doing an amazing job. We live with that sense that we want more of our dad until we die. We want more healing or we want more time and affection with our fathers. I really need you to hear what I'm going to say now. Dads, you have the power in your kids' lives. I've watched children of all walks of life grow up over the past 30 years. And here's one thing I know for sure. When a child has an engaged dad, that is the single most important factor that's going to determine that child's happiness and success. Let me say that again. The single most determining factor of a child's happiness and success depends upon whether or not he or she has an engaged father. Here are three points to ponder. One, fathers, try to look at yourselves from behind the eyes of your children. It will change your perspective on your life and on your parenting. Two, Regardless of your child's body language and age or their words, children truly want their dad. So don't base your worth on what you see. Third, fathers, pursue your kids, especially when they're teenagers. They're not going to always initiate a relationship. It's up to you. Pursue them and start today. Until next time, parents, remember, great kids are raised, not born. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Parenting Great Kids with Dr. Meg Meeker is custom built for you, the parent. So be sure to share the podcast. You can also like Dr. Meg on Facebook and follow her at Meg Meeker. And for the perfect Father's Day gift, check out the new Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters devotional available on Amazon and at your local bookstore. As always, you can let us know what you think of the podcast by writing us a review. And to catch future episodes, be sure to click subscribe.